Here we're at 30 seconds till air. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to call this work session of the Durham City Council to order at one o'clock on Thursday, October the 8th. And I certainly want to welcome everyone here today. We're glad to have all of our staff with us, uh, my colleagues, and also our guests and other people who are listening to this broadcast. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freelon. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. And Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I expect Councilmember Middleton will be with us in a moment. Uh, colleagues, Councilmember Reese is under the weather today uh, and will not be able to attend, but he has. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to have a motion to give him an excused absence. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Freeman, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem, that we give Councilmember Reese an excused absence. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Aye. Member Middleton. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, and now we will move to announcements by members of the council. Are there announcements by members of the council? Council Member Freelon. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have three really quick announcements. One, uh, yesterday we had the groundbreaking at Freedom Park. Um, I was in a joint city county planning meeting that I had to leave from a little early. Uh, we heard from Governor Cooper and Senator Natalie Murdoch uh, and honored two Dermites at that um, meeting, uh, my father, Phil Freelon, and the late John Hope Franklin, who was the inaugural board chair. It was a really great event. And um, I just wanted to, to thank everyone for being there and also encourage folks to check it out and to support that initiative because they're still raising money. It's the first uh, monument honoring African Americans in the state, um, state monument. So long time coming on that one. Um, and two things coming up on Wednesday, October 14th, um, Bishop Clarence Laney will be leading a, a silent vigil around Fayette Place in the afternoon around 3.45, I think is the starting time, but we'll meet at Monument of Faith and um, are just going to walk around Fayette Place and and uh, hope to encourage some movement on uh, that property. And uh, I will be in attendance and just wanted to shout out uh, Bishop Laney's leadership on that. And also on Saturday, October 17th, um, there will be a, a Stanford Durham event at um, Reverend Dr. Jerome Washington's church, Mount Vernon, uh, Pastor Jay Augustine, Dr. Pastor Jay, Reverend Dr. Jonathan Augustine, let me put his whole name out there. Uh, Dr. Angelo Birch uh, and others will be present uh, to stand for uh, accountability and public safety. Um, and that will be at noon, I believe on Saturday, October 17th. So really uh, proud of the work that our local clergy are doing around community organizing and keeping our community safe. So just wanted to shout out Bishop Clarence Laney and, uh, and the team doing the Stanford Durham event on the 14th and 17th of next week. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And it'd be great if you wanted to uh, just email us those dates once in times, It'd be helpful. And I believe you didn't mention that your father was the designer of the Freedom um, Park. And uh, we're, we're, we, all of us in Durham are very proud of that. 
So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any other announcements, Council Member Freeman? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Council Member uh, Freeland, for sharing all those updates. I just want to note that um, the Federal Street Apartments were home to many families for many decades since like the early 50s. And uh, it's important to note that Fayette Place was a failed development and that the actual location was home to many um, as Federal Street projects. So I just want to note that. And uh, I just wanted to share that um, just recognizing that our commissioner, Brenda Howerton, has been working really diligently around the uh, presentation of the Race Equity Commission coming forward on the county side. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, council was aware and supportive of her efforts and acknowledging that it, it's a countywide focus is critical. And um, I appreciate her leadership in that. I wanted to note that the Black Agenda uh, 919 group has been a really supportive push in that work and noting that there's a, a sense of, of um, a muted voice or a lack of input that's been overshadowed for Black folks in Durham. And there's really been a good organizing effort to pull some of those smaller nonprofits and smaller organizers together to make sure that their input is included in the conversations around race equity. And I just wanna make sure that this council is very supportive of that work and figuring out how to make sure that we're, we're, we're showing that support. I would love to hear um, council's perspective around that and just thinking about that for the next work session. Thank you, council and, member. That was Are all. there any other announcements? Council Mayor Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you, uh, uh, Council Freeline, uh, for highlighting those events. Um, on the two that you uh, <clears throat> highlight, I do want to say the first one, uh, Fayette Place is, is under the auspices of Durham Can, and they are seeking some specific uh, ask from us. So I just wanted for you guys to know when we show up, there's also a Metro Council that next day uh, after that event um, <clears throat> seeking some, some commitments from uh, public officials regarding movement on the Fayette Place, uh, full disclosure, I had a meeting with Durham Can last week in which the uh, Fayette Place property was, was brought up and, and they're gonna be very deliberate about seeking some hard commitments. So I just wanna let you folks know, it's not, it's not just a walk. They're, they're looking for some solid commitments from elected officials. And also thank you for that, the event on the 17th, I think I'm actually, I'm one of the speakers at that event on the 17th as well. So um, look forward to, to celebrating with clergy. And I appreciate you, Councilor Freeline, uh, for highlighting those things and for your engagement. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. Any further announcements? All right, thank you, colleagues. Uh, now we'll move to priority items. Are there any priority items by the city manager? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and members of the city council. I do have three priority items this afternoon. Uh, the very first item, I'm pleased to announce uh, and we have in our presence, Wade Walcott. He is the uh, city of Durham's uh, newest director. He's the director of our parks and recreation department. And I would like uh, for just a moment for Wade to come on screen and introduce himself to the council, please. Mr. Good afternoon. Walcott, welcome, we're glad to have you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Pro Tem, members of council. Um, my family and I are so excited to be here in Durham to be able to serve such a, a great community, be a part of a great organization, you know, a great team of, and just really great people and professionals that, that love serving uh, their citizens. So very excited to be here and uh, looking forward to hopefully meeting all of you in, in person or, or virtual just as soon as possible. So thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Walcott. We're very glad to have you with us. We look forward to being able to meet you in person uh, but we know it could be a little while before that happens. But uh, we're, you're joining a, an amazing team, as you said, both uh, at Durham Parks and Rec. And also, uh, we have just, I think, the finest uh, group of department directors anywhere. So uh, welcome to Durham. We're really happy to have you. Thank you very much. If I can be of any assistance, just reach out. I'd give you my phone number, but I don't know what it is yet. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank right. you, Madam Thank Manager. 
Thank you, Wade. And I do have two other items. Uh, agenda item number seven, uh, request to amend the fiscal year 2020-2021 capital improvement project ordinance for the general fund, the solid waste, stormwater, and transit funds, and a grant project ordinance. The title of that agenda item has been updated. And finally, agenda item number 28 is a closed session um, to discuss an economic development matter. Uh, this is a supplemental item uh, and, and we ask that that closed session uh, be held today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Manager. Uh, colleagues, you've heard the manager's priority items. Can I have a motion for their approval? So moved. Mm -hmm. Moved by Councilmember Freeman, seconded by Councilmember Caballero. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Schull. Aye. Mayor Pro Dem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. And Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Madam Manager. Uh, Madam Attorney, any priority <laughs> items today? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. It's good to be with you today. I don't have any priority items, but I would also like to make a brief introduction, if that's okay. We yes, have, of course. Oh, wonderful. Okay. We have with us today uh, the City Attorney's Office extern, Jacob Brannon. Jacob hails from Charlotte, and he's a second-year law student at UNC Law School. Prior to attending law school, he earned his bachelor's degree from Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina. Um, Jacob is working with our CAO intern extern coordinator, Sophia Hernandez, to complete a wide array of research and projects for the attorneys in the CAO, and we're so happy to have him with us. And for my part, um, I wanted him to share in a city council meeting, which is always exciting and interesting. And so I'll let Jacob just say hello really quickly if he can turn on his video. Yes, um, uh, thank you for, for having me here. And uh, like Kim said, I'm, I'm a third year law student at UNC Law and I really appreciate you, um, you know, taking me in to, you know, help, help me learn about all the things that the city does here in Durham. So uh, it's been a wonderful, I've been working for about a, a little over a month and it's been a wonderful experience thus far. And I uh, really appreciate uh, everybody. Jacob, thank you. Welcome. Welcome to Durham City Government. Uh, we know you'll continue to have a great experience and uh, uh, you're working with uh, Sophia and so I know you're I know you're getting a great experience. So thank you so much and thank you, Madam Attorney. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, any priority items today? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council members. The City Clerk's Office has no priority items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll now go through the uh, agenda uh, on the, under the administrative consent items, city clerk's office, item one, approval of city council minutes, item two, Durham Affordable Housing Implementation Committee appointment. I do want to discuss this briefly. Um, the clerk um, uh, had a note on this uh, item um, that we can come back to uh, at the end of the meeting, but did want to note that the person who is applying con uh, currently serves as a city appointee on another board. This is a highly qualified uh, applicant, but I do think we need to think about that and we can discuss that when we come to the appointments at the end of the meeting. Uh, item three, Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission appointment. Item four, Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau Board of Directors, DBA Discover Durham appointments. Mr. Mayor, I, yes. I didn't want to pull the item. I just wanted to note that the scanned attendance record is not clear, and so you can't see folks' names. It would be helpful if that was updated before the council meeting, and that's all. Thank you for noticing that, council member. Uh, item five, Durham Planning Commission appointment. Item six, Durham Workers' Rights Commission appointment. Under departmental items, under Budget and Management Services Department, item seven, request to amend the fiscal year 2021 capital improvement project ordinance for general funds, solid waste, stormwater and transit funds and grant project ordinance. Under Department of Water Management, uh, item eight, North Durham Water Reclamation Facility and Acadia Street Water Main Replacement and Fletcher's Chapel Road Sewer Improvements Award of Construction Contract to Carolina Civil Works, Inc. 
I'm going to pull item eight. Um, item nine under the finance department, interlocal agreement for the collection of taxes with the County of Orange. I'd like I'm to pull that item. Pull item nine. Item 10, resolution for installment financing contract amendment. I'm not going to pull this item, but I do want to notice that this is a savings of $2.8 million over the next 15 years or so. Um, this is uh, the continuing good work of our finance department to take advantage of refinancing opportunities. Uh, and I want to thank and congratulate them. Similarly, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, I apologize. No, go that, ahead. I, wasn't, I was going to pull it, but I figure if, if just noting that comment, it would be good to have um, a publicly available list of all of those bonds because I think people hear that, but they don't, they need to see it as well. And so I'm not sure if it, I know it's in that document we receive at the end of the year for budgets, like in going through the budgets, but I wanted to make sure that it was available on the website someplace. And if it weren't, uh, just a link, uh, if it is already, just a link to be available from a uh, public information site, that would be helpful. Do you mean a link to um, our bond, the various bond financings we have? Yes. Okay. Madam Manager, um, that probably is available at some, some place, but I think you heard the comment of Council Member uh, Freeman. And yes. That's all I had. Yes, it is. It is, it is on the, um, can be accessed through the finance department's page, um, a whole list of all of the, um, you know, the debt issuances and, and outstanding debt that we have. So, uh, we can speak about it and, and get that link to you. Thank you. Thank you. Be good to have that link. Thank you. Under the General Services Department, Item 11, Acquisition of 1602 Midland Terrace, PID 159782. Another win. Item 12, Construction Contract with Engineered Construction Company for Rock Quarry Park Upgrades. I just want to say something particularly about this item. Um, I want to thank Gina Probst, Bo Ferguson, Deborah Giles, and the others who I don't know who may have been involved in the decision to rebid this contract for lack of the appropriate UBE efforts on the, on the, uh, on the part of the various applicants. It was very interesting to read that in the memo. I was really glad that we rebid this, and we got very good UBE results as as a result of that rebidding. And I know that on the part of the Department of General Services, this took time, I know it took effort, I know it cost us some money, but it's an important practice and a high priority for the council and our community. So I wanna thank you for this good work. Also I wanna say that that gives me confidence when we do have these contracts rebid. It gives me confidence that we are looking really hard at these and that the ones that we do let go by because they're, we don't have available subcontractors um, I think that it, it gives me even more confidence uh, in that regard. So I want to really uh, express my gratitude to staff for that. Um, Neighborhood Improvement Services Department, item 13, Fair Housing Assistance Program Grant Project Ordinance. Under the Public Works Department, item 14, Odyssey Drive Culvert Replacement, SD 2020-01. Item 15, Odyssey Drive Culvert Replacement, SD 2018-01, Amendment Number 2. Under Public Hearing, City County Planning Department, Item 16, Consolidated Annexation, 1101 Olive Branch Road. Under 17, Consolidated Annexation, Farrington Road, Multifamily, BDG 1900017. Under Consolidated Annexation, I'm sorry, Item 18, Consolidated Annexation, Naughty Pine Drive Annexation. Item 19, Pascal's Bakery Building and Studebaker Building Landmark Repeal. Under Public Works Department, Item 20, Curb Gutter and Paving Water and Sewer Mains and Water and Sewer Laterals on a portion of Ardmore Drive. Um, Madam Manager, are we hearing about that today? Is that a presentation we'll hear today or will we hear that uh, at another time? Uh, that presentation is scheduled for today, uh, Mr. Mayor. It is the only presentation we have uh, right. on the work session. Uh, and it is, it will be a presentation to precede the hearings that will be at the city council meeting. Perfect, thank you. Item 21, curb gutter and paving water and sewer laterals on a portion of Linden Terrace. Under citizens matters to be heard at one o'clock. Item 22, Dr. Johnson Akinleye. 
Item 23, Kevin Holliday. Item 24, Kenesha Woolard. Item 25, Keyshawn Coleman. Item 26, Beverly Evans. Item 27, Reverend Dr. J. Augustine. And in the closed session will be item 28, closed session to discuss an economic development matter, which we have already approved as priority item. And Mr. So Mayor, Mayor, I have three items that, uh, uh, that we need to discuss before we go to the citizens matters, uh, rather than after we hear the citizens matters. Just want to confirm with you items eight and nine were pulled and we have a presentation for item 15 and then we have the closed session item 28 is that correct and mr mayor if you could pull item 19 i just wanted to get some clarity i was i didn't realize we weren't going to have a presentation on that one okay item 19 is a is a public hearing item um we can certainly pull it um We'll, we'll, I'm not sure. We'll find out if staff is here to be able to present on that. Okay. Uh, Mr. okay. Mayor, point, Mr. Mayor, point of clarification. Mm -hmm. I, I was, under the, I was under, under the understanding that we were to have a presentation on violence interruption at this work session. Am I mistaken? That, that presentation is scheduled for the 22nd. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I, I thought it was accelerated. My bad. Thank you, Madam Manager. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Manager. Um, Madam Manager, I have items 8, 9, 15, a presentation for 15, I'm sorry, pulled items 8, 9, and 19, a presentation for item 15, and then uh, closed session item 28. Is that what you have as well? Th that is what I have, Mayor. Thank you. All right, uh, and now we'll go to our Citizens Matters, and I want to welcome everyone is here today to uh, be heard uh, in front of the council and uh, very much. I know we have a lot of folks from North Carolina Central University here, and I just want to welcome them, give them a hearty welcome and really appreciate them and know that a lot of them have been in touch with us previously about their concerns and uh, looking forward to hear them today. So the first speaker we have is Dr. Johnson Akinleye, our esteemed chancellor, uh, who we are uh, Really happy to have you here today, Mr. Chancellor. Uh, is, is Chancellor Akinleye available to be heard? I am here, uh, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon. And um, I want to thank uh, our mayor and uh, all of our council members uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to come before you this, this afternoon to share a few thoughts with you and to ask for your, um, uh, your, your assistance. As chancellor of this university, uh, I have the pleasure and the responsibility of uh, providing a safe and secure campus environment for 8,000 plus students uh, and uh, 2,500 plus faculty and staff. And uh, I want you to know that we have with the approval of our board, we've done a number of things on our campus. We've invested $3 million into campus security. On our campus, we have more than 900, uh, 360 degree video cameras within our buildings and uh, around our campus. Uh, but even with that, uh, we believe we have a safe campus. But even with that, we are not able to uh, completely control uh, violence uh, coming from the streets around our campus. Um, I have talked to many of you already about this, uh, these issues. Uh, today I have uh, on this meeting with us, Ms. Kenesha Woodlard, who is a student on our campus who experienced the most recent incident uh, about maybe three weeks ago. And she will be talking to you about our experience herself in terms of the street bullets that are coming from the streets onto our campus. In the last three years, we've had about three incidents. Many of you are aware of that. Uh, today, I am coming to you uh, to ask for your partnership and your support and your voice in, in helping us to curb uh, this violence uh, coming from the streets into our campus. I have five recommendations that I'm bringing before you uh, that I'd like for you to uh, support and to help us to implement. One, uh, I'm asking for an MOU between um, our campus police and the city police for a joint or shared jurisdiction on public streets within half a mile radius of our campus, that's one. And number two, I'm asking for the placement 
of uh, dummy police cars with low level uh, patrol lights in major intersections uh, around our campus, uh, as well as increased police patrols and presence. Number three, I'm asking for the installation of speed, speed humps on Fairview Street, uh, Cecil Street, and Lawson Street within the demarcation of our campus. Uh, number four, I respectfully request a six month trial of the shard spotter technology at no, no cost to be installed in and around streets on our campus to at least gather some data and to determine its effectiveness uh, for deterring or preventing gun violence around our campus. Uh, number five, I'm asking for you to uh, allow um, our external affairs uh, director and uh, legislative liaison, uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Page to serve on the community health uh, and safety task force. But that way our university can also engage and be a participant uh, on this very important task force. And it is our goal uh, here uh, that not, we, we are not saying to you that any of this particular recommendation, any one of these recommendations is a panacea for addressing the issues of crime and violence and gun violence around our campus. But what we're suggesting to you here is that doing nothing at all is not an option. And so I am asking you uh, uh, this to, for you to take this as an urgent call to action uh, and we'll seek your support and your partnership uh, in helping us to keep you know, our students, our faculty, and our staff and folks who are coming to visit us on the, in, on the campus are safe by uh, helping us to implement uh, these uh, recommendations that we've presented before you. I wanna thank you again for uh, all of what you do for the city and for the citizens of this, of this uh, great uh, 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 city. Uh, NCCU is a great partner. We've been here for 110 years and we contribute immensely uh, to the economic uh, 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 vibrancy of Durham. And so that's our plea to you. Uh, we're not here to get into a debate or anything at all, but we're simply seeking your support uh, um, and your uh, uh, advocacy in making, making these things uh, happen on our campus. Thank you so much. Chancellor Akinlay, thank you so much for being here. Um, we share the concerns that you expressed and the as you know, uh, the, the gun violence that you've experienced is, is we've had a lot of gun violence in Durham uh, in the past several months, more than we've had in past years. And we all feel that and uh, are grateful to you for bringing these ideas to us. Um, the way we're going to proceed is we'll hear from the other speakers and then colleagues, you may have comments that you want to offer uh, after we hear from the speakers and we'll do that. Um, but, but let me just assure you, Chancellor, that all of those five things that you have raised will be carefully considered by our administration uh, and by the council. Um, Thank you, Mr. Mayo. Yeah. yeah, very much so. I mean, I think that uh, we know, for example, that uh, Duke University has a, a MOU arrangement such as you described. Uh, and these are things that we will very, very carefully consider and work with our administration on. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Kevin Holloway, and I believe Mr. Holloway is the uh, is a is perhaps the chair of the board of the North Carolina Central University Board of Trustees. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Holloway, I uh, received your correspondence, uh, and I'm really glad to have you here today. Thank you so much, and uh, 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 you also have three minutes for your comments. Thank you for being here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. On behalf of the NCCU Board of Trustees, I wanna thank you for providing this opportunity to listen and internalize grave concerns about the safety challenges around North Carolina Central University. There's no greater conflict with fear when parents drop their children off at a college campus to receive a undergraduate education. Their safety is foremost and this is typically discussed again and again and again before parents arrive and depart. I know this to be true because I had two daughters who are graduates from North Carolina Central University and they received a heavy dose of be careful. 
You comfort your fears as a parent by prayers and believing that if your child addresses all the precautions, their safety is assured. It is apparent with recent incidents that we are teetering on disaster. We are in a perilous position without the city's intervention to mitigate risk on our campus. My personal opinion is that NCCU and the city of Durham are linked together at the hip with one heavily impacting the other. Improvements to the city of Durham make NCCU a place where a student's educational experience is enriched as the university activities on campus enhance revenue for the city of Durham. This can't happen if we don't improve the safety around our campus. I don't want you or me to be in a position where we stand in front of parents and alumni answering the question, what did you do to prevent this? After having the discussion and make the, making the appeal we are today. I just keep thinking, as a trustee, we were a few inches away from experiencing a unforgivable disaster. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I appreciate you addressing this matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Holloway. We're grateful to have you here. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kanisha Willard. And Ms. Willard, um, I want to first uh, welcome you and tell you uh, that we share the university's uh, not only concern, but horror that a, that a bullet uh, would have entered your room. And we're glad to hear you have you today and are looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and Mayor Pro Tem. I thank you all for this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I am Kinesia Willard. I am a junior here at North Carolina Central University and I major in social work. I am also the recent victim of the shooting that occurred here, which resulted in a bullet coming through my room window. Um, I am not okay. I am facing this trauma each and every day, the anxiety and the fear of the incident each and every day. And I believe that we need an action plan immediately because our campus is, is not safe from the residents and criminals that are surrounding our community. This is a place that we are supposed to come to from our homes and feel safe and feel at home. And that has been taken from us in a matter of two months with the cases that we have had on this campus. Um, I agree with everything that my chancellor has presented to you. I believe everything that he has implemented is serious and it is necessary to make sure that our campus is safe because at this very moment I was just very just inches away of losing my life and I do not want this to happen to any other fellow eagle on this campus and so therefore we are here today to make sure that safety is guaranteed and implemented seriously. We need connections to more of Durham's police department. We need more safety cameras. We need more implementations that assure that these criminals, these shooters, these assaulters, these robbers are not going to continue to use our campus as a battleground. And I thank you all for hearing us today. And I pray that you all, that you all seriously take in consideration all that my chancellor has offered because he's working hard and I am hoping that times will get better here because I'm facing so much after this incident. And I just thank you. Ms. Willard, thank you for being here. I know it's probably even hard to talk about it, but you did so very eloquently and persuasively. And our hearts are with you. I want you to know that. And we hear you about the need to take action. And we're grateful for you for being here. Thank you. Um, next, we have Beverly Evans. Ms. Evans, welcome, and you also have three minutes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ms. Evans. All right, thank you. Uh, words, can, I am Beverly Evans, and I am a member of the community of College Heights, which is around 
uh, surrounding NCCU. And words just cannot express how the residents of College Heights are feeling anxious, alarmed, and neglected for our safety with hearing the constant gunshots and criminal activity in some of these rental properties around the college. On January 10th, 2019, College Heights was designated as a National Historic District for its unique African-American neighborhood from the 30s to the 60s. And just a little history, there are 12 buildings on NCCU's campus named after residents of College Heights with 38 professors and personnel that lived in our neighborhood. There were also 28 personnel of North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, including the president, Joseph Goodlow on Masondale, 40 public school teachers, uh, one mechanics and farmers bank president, John Hervey Wheeler, who was the federal courthouse was named after, as well as a host of entrepreneurs. And in fact, uh, John Hervey Wheeler's house, where his son still lives, uh, had a bullet shot through the living room window, as well as my car, and I live on Otis Street, that was parked in the backyard, a bullet that was shot up in the air came down on my car, causing $1,200 worth of damage. The oldest resident in the neighborhood is 104 years old, living on Cecil Street, with a number of others in their 90s. And the ages on Lawson Street by the dormitory are 98, 88, 80, 76, 65, 60, where there are only two males in that whole entire block where there have been many gunshots and incidences. And we're all frightened by hearing these shots, which have become more and more prevalent. We need you to approve that six month trial for that shot spotter that detects gunfire and we need more cameras on the streets entering into the community. We need a substation back in this area. So when we do call the police, it won't take them forever to get here. And then the perpetrators are gone by the time they arrive. We need, a, we need undercover police to monitor the hot spot rental houses where suspects are frequenting because vandalism and theft is on the rise especially there on Lawson Street between Fayetteville and Concord. A fine needs to be given to these landlords with a substantial lien or something for a certain number of calls, the same way um, these, um, especially when there's suspicious activity and they're called there for a certain number of times, just like the homeowners um, get fined if they call uh, the police for false alarms after a certain number of times they are fined. Well, these people need to be, these homeowners need to be fined when, when uh, police are called for suspicious activities going on in their rental properties because they don't care. And a lot of the original homeowners have died, passed on, and either their houses are sold and these people don't live there. They're not homeowners. They are just renting it out then those renters bring in other suspicious people from other parts of the area and are just creating havoc. And we need the city police to work with NCCU police so that we can work together because our community is willing to sign a petition for this technology and anything else that we need to do because we have older members of the society living in our neighborhood and they are afraid and I just uh, can't stand to hear them saying that they have to get down on the floor when they hear gunshots because they are so afraid of being hit, uh, something coming through a window or whatever, because a, a gunshot can travel up a mile up in the air and land wherever. So it's just very dangerous, and we really need the help, and the members of College Heights are willing to do whatever it takes to help us feel safe like we used to in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. We appreciate it. We hear you. Uh, we appreciate it. You do have a wonderful neighborhood uh, and a unique neighborhood and a historic neighborhood and you do need to be safe. So thank you for being here. Um, I believe that I skipped Keyshawn Coleman and I apologize. Are you here? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome oh. and you also have three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, city officials, city council members, and the Durham community. I am Keyshawn Coleman, and I currently serve as the student body president here at North Carolina Central University. 
I come to you in agreement with our Chancellor, Johnson O. Akinleye, for the City Council to take immediate action and aid us in resolving and reducing the crime in our local community. Both the members of the immediate NCCU and Greater Durham, Durham Community have a shared responsibility in maintaining and ensuring a safe environment for our university faculty, staff, and students, as well as the residents and visitors of the City of Durham. We understand that there are increased instances of crime in our local Durham community. However, we must work together to take action in the community and decrease such activity that is going on. With an on-campus community of roughly 5,000 students from various cities, states, and even countries, we know that all students who call NCCU home want to feel safe and protected. In such an unprecedented time as this, coupled with the stress college students often experience, we must work together to ensure our students, faculty, and staff are safe at their home away from home. No one should come to their workplace, place of learning, or residence and feel unsafe and unprotected. We appeal to the tools such as the trial period of spot shooter to allow for our university and community to enhance public safety and build trust. This tool has proven effective in helping other communities such as Clark Atlanta University and the surrounding Atlanta community reduce gun violence and improve the police community relationship. Our students reside on campus and all members of the Durham community should go to sleep at night and not worry about what may happen if they close their eyes or whether they will be allowed to see the next day. Together, we can turn this situation around and make our Durham the safe community it can be. So again, I strongly urge you guys to take heed of this matter and work with us, North Carolina Central University, to ensure that our city becomes free of crime and a place where all of us can feel safe and proud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Coleman. Uh, we really appreciate you being here with us and sharing that with us. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll hear from Reverend Dr. J. Augustine, whose name was earlier invoked uh, already at this meeting, uh, and we're glad to have you. Thank Reverend you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I thank you for your service. I have had the opportunity to work, I think, with most of you in an individual capacity, so I truly respect the wonderful work you do. Um, I want to appeal to you to support uh, the five-fold proposition as offered by uh, Chancellor Akinle, um, and I appeal to you in a two-fold capacity. Uh, first, as a pastor, I am a, a, the leader and a good corporate citizen, uh, but I am also leading an institution that has had a long-term partnership with North Carolina Central University, and I personally am one of Chancellor Akinle's biggest fans and, and one of the biggest advocates of the institution. Both of those roles from which I appear before you lead, for your purposes, lead to economic development. And let me unpack for just a moment. In the capacity of a corporate citizen, St. Joseph shares the Fayetteville corridor. We are literally a stone's throw from North Carolina Central University. Uh, my pastoral leadership operates under the fundamental premise that the church must leave the building meaning the church is not a physical structure, but the church is the people. We are still, even in the midst of a pandemic where we are not having traditional worship, we are still engaged in voter registration at this time of year. We are still engaged in feeding the homeless uh, and being advocates for those who are the most marginalized in our community. We have a vested interest in ensuring our community is safe. We wanna be a good citizen and ensure that all of Durham is safe, but particularly that area. Secondly, as someone who is a very strong supporter of NCCU and of Chancellor Akinle's leadership, to give you an example, once a quarter, we typically have a hashtag NCCU Sunday, a philanthropic event where we raise scholarship funds for the school. We recognize that this institution is not simply a local school, it's not simply a state school, it is a national entity that attracts people from all over the country, and in fact, I would say from various parts of the world. I'm speaking anecdotally now. I don't have a white paper before me. I don't have any firm statistics, but based on my own experience, people tend to stay in close proximity to places where they went to school. In that regard, that means North Carolina Central University is an economic driver for the city of Durham, and it's a, it's a tremendous benefit to the entire state of North Carolina. So we want to work together. We want to work collaboratively to make sure that students are safe, students have a wonderful experience, and students are willing to stay in this area and, and prayerfully uh, uh, add to the economy after graduating. 
I also am deeply touched by the remarks offered by Sister Wood Woodward, if I pronounced the last name correctly, as well as my sister from the community who invoked the name of John Hervey Wheeler for whom the federal courthouse was named. I did the prayer of invocation at the naming of the Wheeler Courthouse, not because I'm a magical person, but because I am the pastor of a church where he was a lifelong member. Our church has had a history of being engaged and being a, a, a problem solving, of solving problems in the community, and we wanna remain consistent here. So I would encourage you, Mr. Mayor, and ladies and gentlemen of the council, to the extent uh, supporting or adopting Chancellor Achenlay's five-fold uh, uh, position calls for a fiscal allocation, I ask you to please consider it. To the extent it calls for something like community policing, we're forming a task force, I would ask you to please be creative. We have got to support this institution and we've got to ensure that crime is detoured and, uh, 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 and do all we can to solve the problems. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Augustine. It's really good to have you with us and we really appreciate your support for the university. Thank you so much. Colleagues, you have heard our speakers, and now I'm going to ask if anyone has any remarks that they would like to make uh, in response. Any, anyone? Uh, Councilmember Freeman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I uh, want to thank you all for being here this afternoon and sharing um, your story and your message of uh, how you feel safety should occur in our city. I, I understand... Uh, the gravity of the insecurity that has been felt. I, I wanna um, send my sincerest um, apologies to the young lady, Miss Woodward, M Woodlard, uh, Kinesia Woodlard. I wanna make sure I say her name because it could have been a say her name situation um, had her life been lost. I, I am, I've been deeply disturbed um, about the gun violence in our city. And I've raised the issue a number of times here on council and in the community. We've had this, these conversations. We've continued to have the, the kind of talk about what we're gonna do. And I wanna make sure that I'm clear that whether it's a resolution from this council or working on a petition from the community, I am here and I am supportive of moving forward with your five uh, requests. And I wanna make sure that I note that as a student of North Carolina Central, a representative for Ward 1 in which the North Carolina Central University sits, as well as College Heights, I am deeply committed to making sure that the over 10,000 people that, that you represent um, in this community are represented well and your voice is, has been heard. And it's not just um, words, it's not just a presentation, it's not just about having this, this task force in place or what have you, it's about making sure that you're safe and what that safety looks like should come from you as a community. I am deeply, deeply honored to, um, to be in this position and to be able to serve. And so when I spoke to Dr. Johnson this morning, I was, I was a little, I, I mean, I'm trying to catch up and trying to figure out what's going on because I know this is, a, this is the second time that you've had this conversation with me about a student who's almost been shot on campus in their dorm room and it's unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable to the point that it starts to make me feel that I don't know what, we're, I don't know what we can do as a council in a city because it's not limited to the city, but, it is, but there are things we can and whatever that is, how it looks, what it looks like, I think we should be working towards that. I know that the, the previous conversation, uh, council member Middleton brought up about uh, the expediency of the violence interrupt the program that uh, council member Freelon has brought back to the council again um, it's interesting that this it's not happening yet and it's also the conversation about how shot spotter is not moving forward these are the things that make people feel like nothing's happening and if you don't hear it and you don't see it you don't know what's happening i want to be clear in saying that i'm here i hear you and i'm with you on this and whatever needs to be done i will be willing to do I would um, offer as well that I have been in conversation with Council Member Freelon, and I know with his work around uh, trying to figure out how to bring the violence into erupt the program forward, I think that we can work on a resolution that would entertain that immediately, um, whether it's at the next council work session or what have you. However it needs to be, there needs to be a sense of urgency around this in the same way that we move to address uh, other issues of safety. I want to also um, thank 
the Dr. Augustine and not Reverend Dr. Augustine and also noting that it's not just the safety aspect, it's the health. And so I wanna thank you for hosting the COVID-19 testing uh, at your church location, acknowledging that you're taking on the risk of you know, infecting people in there. Just being on the front line of the work and being a hero in our community around making sure that people get the testing they need. Because I know overwhelmingly that the people who were in those lines were black and brown, Latino and not people who would show up or be tested in other places. And that was really uh, a great uh, ad, added value to, to the work that, that has to happen in this city. This is a complete and total um, concern that I've raised around the way in which we pulled together around the Community Health and Safety Task Force. I'm grateful that things have moved along and we're including the city, the county and the school board with their own input and acknowledging that it was, again, I mean, I am not, I'm not always speaking about what happens at the, on the county side, but I think that the addition of making sure that someone who is a parent or a caregiver of a murdered child is included in a, in a community health and safety task force is phenomenal. And I think that having a representative from North Carolina Central University would also be phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman. Thank you, council member. Um, other colleagues, council member Freelon. Yes, thank you, uh, Chancellor Akinle, <clears throat> Brother Holloway, Kinesia, um, Ms. Beverly, Evans, Keyshawn, Reverend Dr. J. Augustine. Thank you all for uh, sharing these ideas with us. Um, I'm inspired by the spirit of self-determination that I've come to know of as part of the Eagle culture, not waiting for the city to come up with solutions, but like look, this is what we need, do these five things. I think that's really helpful and grounding. It gives us a, 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 some, some direct action, some roadmaps uh, to look at and to see what's in our capacity to do. Uh, I wanna echo Reverend Dr. J. Augustine's uh, elevating the, the voices of uh, Kinesia Woolard. Um, I just wanna say, sister, that the, to hear you talk about your trauma and anxiety and fear, and I could literally hear it in your voice, I think we all could. Um, you know, I just want to say that, that, um, you know, we, I'm doing everything I can every day, uh, to address this issue. It's my biggest priority and, uh, moving the violence interrupter program. That's just one of many steps and many conversations that I'm having in the community. And I just want you to know that I feel you and, uh, you know, you can reach out, uh, anytime, uh, you want to talk or build about ideas or solutions. And I really appreciate your presence here, especially given the, the vulnerable uh, energy that you brought with you today. I really felt that. And um, Ms. Beverly Evans, uh, you're, thank you for providing that history, uh, hearing about the legacy of, of uh, um, Herbie Wheeler. And um, I, I wanna go ahead and name, you talked about the elder women who are in the community, that 104 year old women, woman Mozella McLaughlin, affectionately mm -hmm. known as Miss Mac. Uh, she, that's one of the women who helped raise me. I spent many, many days in her backyard uh, uh, being nurtured by that woman. Um, and I actually told uh, Chancellor um, about this uh, when we met with Dr. Page last week that she was the one who brought me on North Carolina Central's campus in 1992 when uh, I guess then candidate Clinton came to visit the campus and kind of got me started thinking about civic life. Um, and so that, that her home on Cecil street, uh, you know, I know so many people in that community and I, and I appreciated hearing that historical context. I grew up on those blocks, you know, right around this area um, by St. Titus uh, where my family attended church uh, growing up and also, I just want to connect my childhood here in Durham. I mean, Kinesia, I, I, I've been writing in emails. You may have gotten this in, in response to some emails that I've sent, but I remember hearing, you know, bullet shots right outside my bedroom window uh, growing up here in Durham. This gun violence thing has been with us for a very long time. And I'm really interested and passionate about exploring some, some radical new avenues for envisioning and creating safe communities. 
and engaging folks who are directly impacted by that violence in the creation of new solutions that can move our community forward. Um, that is my number one absolute biggest priority. Um, and so um, I'm kind of rambling here, I apologize, but I just wanna say that I've been moved by what I've heard here today. Um, these five bullet points will get my thoughtful consideration and uh, I appreciate each of your presence here and Eagle Pride Amplified. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Freeline. Would anyone else like to make comments? Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Brother Chancellor, Mr. President, Student Body President, um, to all of the Eagles, thank you so much uh, for being here today. Last night, the world uh, witnessed the, the power and brilliance and passion of America's historically black colleges and universities and the performance that Senator Kamala Harris delivered. Um, we are seeing that brilliance and passion again here today. Uh, and I'm extremely proud and grateful for all of you. I'm, I'm proud to be a product of historically black college and university. And, and you are doing us all extremely proud and North Carolina Central University proud today. Um, I want to, to say, uh, I ap apologize to you because it shouldn't have to take all of this. But stony the road we trod, bit of the chastening rod. This is our lot. It always takes a little more uh, for us. Um, let me at the outset say I, I wholeheartedly support your, your, your recommendations. Uh, I wanna also say to, to my friends and colleagues, um, elected and otherwise, um, I understand that sometimes there might be messenger fatigue that sometimes we'll get tired of hearing something because it's from a particular person rather than the substance of the thing. But, but if I might, I, I want to just appeal to my colleagues and, and perhaps we're seeing some of it today. The, the utter visceral feeling of disrespect that not all, but some black people feel when folk who don't live where they live or experience what they experience write prescriptions uh, uh, without any consideration of uh, uh, what the people they're writing the prescription for has to say about their symptoms. It is this, and, and I've spoken to some of these students, I've spoken to many in the community. It is a visceral uh, a feeling uh, uh, of, of how dare you while watching the other things we do. So, so and I had one student say to me uh, uh, that I don't understand why we would not try something for free to get data, but when it comes to climate change, all we talk about is we believe in science. Um, do not let our echo chambers and our ideology have us miss an opportunity at best to make some changes or dents in the numbers at best, at worst, at least to have the moral authority to say to folk, we have tried and we are trying everything that we can because folk just aren't getting it that you saying that uh, uh, I know what's so good for us that even if it's free to hell with it, we're not trying it. Folk are feeling viscerally disrespected by that proposition. Meanwhile, let me tell the students what the council's up to on the other side of the ledger. Uh, there are folk in our city who can't stand on their porches because the brightness of lights and the qual their quality of life is being impacted by the brightness of lights, and it should not be. And we are pulling out paper, we are racking up the cost of how we're gonna fix this problem. We are spending $100 a pop in shields on lights to fix the problem because folk have appealed to us, much like you're doing today, um, have organized and written us letters uh, because it's a quality of life issue. There are other people in the city who can't go on their porches either, but it ain't got nothing to do with lights. They can't go on their porches because gunfire is constantly ringing out. I would say that counts as a nuisance as well. And, and when they see us spending money, racking our brains, uh, rightfully so, to address that issue, but seemingly not willing to do anything uh, on the other side 
uh, people start to wonder what is going on. And what it looks like is that if you're from a well-heeled, high turnout community, it looks like you get responses. And if you're not from a high turnout community or well-organized community, um, the conversation goes on a bit longer. So I wanna encourage you just like every other community, uh, uh, every other uh, 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 group in this city to keep pressing. Organize and keep pressing. Don't let anybody tell you they know what's better for you or your community than you. No other community puts up with that. No other community allows someone to write a prescription for them and then drives home to their neighborhood. Keep advocating, keep calling out, keep, keep getting in our faces, keep sending us emails just like every other community does. I wanna commit myself again publicly to doing everything we can, to pulling every lever, pushing every button. This isn't a political issue. I don't live in a neighborhood where I hear gunfire every night. So this, this isn't personal for me. Much of my supporters are reflexively and ideologically pushing against the uh, shot spot. And the people that it impacts most, the most vulnerable people, are in a high turnout community. So this is not a politically expedient issue in any way. But it's the right thing to be pushing for because people who live in these neighborhoods, live in these communities, every day are asking, what is my government doing concrete? When I go to funerals, when I, what is the government doing to address this issue? And alas, uh, uh, once again, here come the HBCUs. Here come those beautiful, black, brilliant brains, once again, to galvanize us and to focus us and to call attention to what needs to be done. And it shouldn't take all this, but that's our lot in this country. So we accept it and we accept the mantle. Brother Chancellor, um, thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you so much to my sister, uh, um, Willard. Uh, thank you so much for your story. Um, I thank God that you are still with us. And I know, although the bullet didn't hit you, I know that you were still hit and that there's still some trauma and pain and our prayers are with you as you continue to heal. Um, NCCU, you are just as vested and as important and as much of a part of the fabric of this city as Duke or any other institution in this city. And what you said to me, brother, I won't call your name, but what you said to me, brother, I absolutely agree with you. If this were going on in other zip codes, we'd have had shot spotter, helicopters, and everything else that we can throw at it if it were other communities. Keep pushing. We have your support. You have my support. Uh, I hope that you will have uh, all of our support in your recommendations, not just for Central, because you, you're going to be all right. You're brilliant. You're educated. You're going to be the privileged amongst us. But for those who live in other communities uh, who may not have the privilege or access that you have or have the ability to craft a statement like you have, it's important for them as well that we pull every lever and push every button so we'll have the moral authority to look people in the eye and say, your government is trying everything. And if it doesn't work, take it down. Let's put somebody else's money where our mouths are. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go Eagles. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, any further comments? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, join my colleagues in thanking our representatives from NCC for coming and speaking with us today um, and sharing your, uh, your experiences and what's happening on your campus. I was especially interested in my um, previous con conversation with the chancellor to learn about the disparity between the um, Duke Police Department having an area outside of campus where they um, have access and are able to patrol in the North Carolina Central Police Department, um, not having that and would be interested in learning more from, um, from our staff or from, you know, any from the folks at the university who could tell us, you know, why that's the case um, and what the arguments are for for extending that authority, I mean, I feel like the council, the chancellor, made a um, a good argument for extend for you know being able to extend that, um, and I'm sure that the Duke Police Department makes use of it. I feel a little bit under, um, I yeah, I I don't understand why that disparity would exist, and would like to know why and whether you know what power we have in that 
in that area. And then of course the other recommendations, um, I'm sure that our staff will be, will be looking into all of them and, and giving us um, a full report in the near future. Um, there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in this issue. And we, we know that, you know, in Durham and in every community around the country, there continues to be a lot of work to be done on gun violence and particularly in the context of COVID. And, you know, we're in the, the largest social and economic crisis that we've seen in this country in a hundred years. And so we know that this is going to be a significant challenge moving forward um, for our community and for communities all over the country. And we are, uh, we will continue to work hard to meet that challenge uh, for our residents, both, you know, making sure that we have the resources in place to manage violence when it occurs and that we are putting proactive um, programming and and resources in place to prevent these kinds of incidents before they occur. So just want to thank you all again um, for coming and sharing your, your thoughts and your concerns and your experiences with us. And um, this is absolutely, you know, a, a very high priority for the council that we deal with both the, um, the, the violence that we know is increasing as well as all the other, you know, impacts on COVID impacts of COVID and the economic crisis on our neighborhoods, especially our most vulnerable neighborhoods um, and this, and this social disruption and, and community um, stress and crisis that is, that we know is only getting worse. Um, so thank you. We appreciate you. And uh, we're, we're here to help. Thank you so much. Uh... Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Caballero. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, for everyone from Central who came to speak with us. I very much appreciated the conversation I had with the Chancellor a few days ago. Um, I will be reflecting on the suggestions that were made by the Central community today. Uh, I look forward to the Violence Interrupter Program conversation we'll be having on the 22nd. Uh, I think everyone here is extremely concerned around the increased gunfire that is happening in Durham and unfortunately across the country. Um, it is terrifying to live with gun violence uh, in front of your home where you don't feel safe. Um, no one should live like that. We're doing, it is something that it's hard to hear about. Um, when I first moved to Durham, I feel like the gun violence was spread very much across the city. And then over time, our crime decreased. And while there were definitely terrible pockets, it seemed like we were making great improvements. And I'm very concerned about what has been happening over the last six months to a year where gun violence is spread across our city and it is causing tragedy in many, many communities. I look forward to continuing the conversations with my council members. And again, I appreciate the folks coming out to advocate for their needs for their community. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, council member. Chancellor, uh, thank you for being here and for bringing your delegation. Um, I think what would be most helpful, and you may have already done this, is to put your five recommendations uh, into writing for us, send it to us, send it to uh, uh, city manager Wanda Page, uh, and we will pay prompt attention to it. Uh, I can promise you that. Thank you. Thank you and so much. I, I really, um, you know, we all feel a tremendous loyalty to North Carolina Central. You know, Chancellor, that my first job out of graduate school was working at North Carolina Central uh, as an instructor uh, I feel, as I know we all do, a tremendous loyalty, a tremendous debt of gratitude. Um, and uh, we, we know the critical importance to you all of having a safe campus. Uh, we, we deeply understand that every single one of us, everybody in this community knows that. And my colleagues have talked about the violence, the gun violence that we've had in Durham that has increased this last several months. And it's been taken a terrible toll. Uh, and we need to do everything every day to fight that. And so your suggestions are most welcome. And I look forward to receiving, I know we all will, and we'll work with our city manager uh, to take those on uh, as soon as possible. So thank you. 
Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, and to uh, all of the council members. I am uh, deeply uh, touched uh, by your passion and by your commitment, and uh, I look forward to working with each and every one of you, uh, as you've said, as you've heard, to make our, our community uh, collectively safe for all of our citizens. So I do thank you so much, and uh, we would um, get our um, recommendations to uh, Ms. Page, and of course, uh, look forward to the responses from you. So thank you again uh, for the time that you've uh, given to us this afternoon. We thank you, it. Chancellor. And thank you to all the rest of you all who are here with us today. And again, to uh, Ms. Woolard, uh, our heart is with you. You need to know that. Uh, we are just, it's beyond words that you would have to face a situation where a gunshot came into your room. And we will work as hard as we can to change this, not only for you, but for everybody in Durham who's under the same sort of, uh, who's endured the same kind of thing. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, colleagues, uh, that was important and I'm glad we were able to hear from so many members of the North Carolina Central University community. Um, and we know that we'll hear back soon We'll have some discussion with our administration on these on these matters. And Mr. Mayor, I know, I know they'll vet them and I'll be back with this. Yes, Councilmember. Just a quick question before Dr. Johnson leaves. I just wanted to know if their if their social sciences department um, have been working on anything currently. I wasn't sure, but I just wanted to double check before um, letting him depart. I thought I heard something about that. Council member, I don't see Dr. Akinleye still on the call, uh, but that's something that um, I think that, you know, would be good if you wanted to just convey that question to him or to someone else there would be good to, to find that out. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're now going to move back to our, uh, our items that have been pulled and we're going to start with item eight. Uh, this is an item that I pulled, North Durham Water Reclamation Facility and Acradia Street Water Maintenance. Hello, Mr. Greeley. Good afternoon, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council. Don Greeley, Department of Water Management. Mr. Greeley, uh, good to see you. Um, the, um, I just wanted to discuss the employment statistics for this contractor. Um, this is, um, Carolina Civil Works Incorporated. And I wanted to, uh, know if there was anyone present today who I could, uh, discuss this issue with. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware that they were available, um, for the call, but we'll be happy to, uh, you know, if you have some questions, we'd be happy to get a response from them and add it to the agenda. Thank you. So um, looking at their total number of employees, they have 27 employees, only one of whom is African-American. And so, um, Mr. Greeley, you've heard my usual questions and council's frequent questions. Um, I'm interested in their hiring practices. Uh, I'm interested in their outreach to uh, HBCUs and other uh, societies and organizations, professional organizations, where African American candidates would be uh, available to them. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in hearing about their outreach. And so if you could provide that in writing before our Monday night meeting, that would be excellent. Or if they could provide that in writing. We, we'd be happy to provide that. And uh, although we're not in the, uh, although our, you know, one of the things that we often ask is of people to come before us, we're not in the situation now with our youth internships that we usually are. Uh, but I would also be um, interested to know whether or not they would be uh, a, a, a willing participant in our youth internship program. We'd be happy to ask that question as well. That would be great. Um, and so I'll look forward to receiving that uh, and the council uh, to receive that prior to Monday night. Certainly. Thank you very much, Mr. Greeley. Sure. 
I think that uh, just to the administration, I, I think that um, since we've been in the COVID era, when these issues have come up, we've been less likely to have one of the contractors here. So I'll try to provide that information earlier so that we can have someone here to be able to discuss this with. So thank you. All righty, uh, now we'll move to item nine. Um, item nine is also an item that I pulled. Um, and I see Mr. Boyd. Hi, Mr. Boyd. Good afternoon, David Boyd, uh, finance director. So um, I asked you this question and I see I got an email back from you already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I see that we're paying one half of 1% for the Orange County tax collection. And I believe we pay 1% for the Durham tax collection. That's correct. And so, and I, and I ask you if Orange does all its tax collection for its various municipalities for one half of 1%. And you yes, they do. They so we're paying more in Durham than the municipalities in Orange are paying in Orange. Is, do you know, I mean, I, you may not know this, but is there any rational basis for this that is, is there a rational basis for well, the what fact Orange that we're paying twice? For Durham County? <laughs> <laughs> um, Great question. The fact that we're paying twice what they are for our tax collection, what uh, Chapel Hill would be. I, I don't know that we have done any um, significant analysis on the fee that is being charged by Durham County for quite some time. That, that fee has been put in place for quite some time. Um, okay. So uh, that's that's all I can say to you on on that front right now. So uh, you know, when I think about this, this is a lot of money. It's a you know half of one percent difference in our entire property tax collection. So do we have a kind? And again, I'm not sure this is really your bailiwick. And if not, we can. Um, and I see Manager Page is here, but do we have a contract currently? Um, I'm sure we have a contract. Did, I, I, I've how with often do we do that? We, we do have a, a, a contract with the county. I believe it expires at the end of next year, uh, I believe is when the current contract expires. Yes. In fact, I think you put that in the memo now that I'm remembering. And then well, we, also have, we also have an agreement with Wake County for them to collect ta taxes for the portions of the city that are in Wake County. Right. Well, so it seems to me it would be good. Uh, and, and it would be good uh, when that comes up that to be renegotiating knowing what our um, you know our, our peers are doing and the fact that I hear that Orange County is only charging half a percent and Durham charges one percent Durham County leads me to think that we when we renegotiate this we need to have a one half percent fee um, rather than a one percent fee and this will of course be a significant benefit to the city. We'll certainly take that into consideration as we look at the agreement in the future. Thank you. Madam Manager, did you have any other comments? Sorry, uh, not significant comments, but, but certainly those agreements are negotiated with the other parties and, and we have actually reviewed the terms every time we renew the five-year agreement. And so we certainly will take these comments in consideration um, as we, you know, as we look at what that fee covers for the county that has to actually do the services for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Manager, and thank you, Mr. Boyd. I just really hope, you know, given the large difference in, in revenue this could mean for us, that we'll take a hard look at this when it's time to renegotiate. So thank you. Certainly. All right, our next item is item not to, we're going to go we're going to have the presentation uh, at the end madam manager we'll go down to item 19 which was pulled by council member freeman and this thank you is Mr. um pascal's bakery building and studer bakery building landmark repeal yes and i understand staff's not on the call i just want to make sure that we uh do have some some documentation i guess around the trade-offs of doing this repeal for this landmark site, acknowledging that it's right on Duke Street. I know that it's the site from the explosion, but I'm not sure what the removal of that landmark designation will mean. And so I just wanted to get a little bit more clarity around it. Um, I think specifically, uh, if there are height restrictions uh, and just what could be on the site, just acknowledging all of those things, and that would be helpful. 
before my, before the council meeting. Thank you. Um, Madam Manager, you heard the request of Council Member Freeman. I, I, I expect that those things will be provided. Is that true? Uh, yes, yes. And Council Member, if you have some specific questions that you don't see answered in the memos, uh, I think the memos that we have now are what is expected being provided at the Council meeting for the public hearing. So if there are questions that you have specifically that aren't in those memos, if you could let the manager know that as soon as you can, and so she can get uh, staff to prepare any answers you need. Thank you. I think those are specifically the questions that weren't answered in the memo. Could so you say them one more time? Just noting uh, the, the, what, what designations would be in place around height and I guess specifications, and then also materials, noting that that area is right there on Duke Street. Okay. Thank you. Did you get that, Madam Manager? Yes, I do have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Now we'll move to item 15, um, which is uh, a present, I'm sorry, item, I'm sorry, not item 15. Item, what's the presentation item, Madam Manager? 28. I don't know why. I've said item 15, but item 28. No, it is It is actually, uh, the presentation is on item 20. Item 20, th sorry. Yes. Yeah, tw uh, 28 is the closed session. Closed so session. before that, we'll have the the uh, the discussion on, public, on item 20. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. A actually, the presentation covers item, item, really item 20 and 21. And 21, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Colleagues, just to remind you, this is a public hearing item, uh, but staff wanted us to, uh, we don't usually hear presentations on public hearing items unless staff feel it's important that we get educated ahead of time. And so we're uh, glad to have that. Who is here to present to us today? I see Mr. Joyner. Hi, Mr. Joyner. Afternoon, sir. Um, would the clerk please call up the presentation uh, to share on the screen? Mr. Joyner, could you introduce yourself? Certainly. Robert Joyner with the Public Works uh, Department. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pertem, members of the council. I'm here today to present the City of Durham petition process on items 20 and 21. These are petition items that are coming forward uh, for the council uh, public hearing for the, the council to make a decision on in the upcoming council meeting. Uh, to start with, I wanted to give a background on the petition process and what it's used for. Uh, these items do not come before council a lot, uh, so you can see them fairly infrequently, sometimes going years in between them. Uh, petition process is for infrastructure improvements. City of Durham has a process where property owners can have various types of improvements made. Council is the final authority to decide on those types of things. That authority is governed by the city charter. And it starts where an interested party contacts public works and looks for a defined area for the types of improvements. Those improvements can be water, sewer, roads, curb and gutter, um, a, a various number of improvements, sidewalk, things of that nature. And so, um, those uh, petitions are developed around a specific area. And the folks in that area uh, where those improvements are adjacent um, will be the ones who will potentially uh, be assessed those costs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Public Works Department is the point of contact. It is where you go to find all the information on utility service availability, the types of extensions and improvements that would be required with these petitions, the petition process itself. It includes issuance of the petition, uh, determination of sufficiency, and all of the associated property research. 
the reason that's important is because you're actually signing on the dotted line when you sign on that petition that you wish to be assessed for those improvements. So it is important that the property owner of record is the one signing for the assessment because that will be the person that is assessed. Um, the agenda processing for ordering of improvements, we actually create all of these agenda items and bring them forth for council consideration. Next slide, please. Here's a diagram of the infrastructure improvement petition process. It's originally issued from Public Works by the sponsor. Those limits are determined. And then the uh, proposed improvement is reviewed by the design group for constructability. Petition process is delivered to the, the sponsor. And then the sponsor circulates that to the property owners in favor of the improvements. And you go through this iterative step where you go through and you're looking for, and this is an and, you're representing 50% of the owners and 50% of the road frontage. And this step is actually really critically important because it prevents um, a large landowner from controlling the process without talking to their neighbors. So you can't have anybody who is disproportionately um, in charge. It's a very rare circumstance where that can happen. And so you go through that iterative process of determining that everybody who signed on that is the owner of the property. Then the property owners are notified when a public hearing comes uh, across. And then um, if it's not approved, that project doesn't move forward. If it is approved, it goes into the list and the project is looked at being designed and then funding for delivery of the project ultimately is then decided through the CIP process. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the most common types of petition improvements. Um, but I wanted to note the differences between the petition improvement versus what we are looking at under the CIP gravel road paving program. Uh, which is uh, finishing, um, putting down pavement for uh, existing dirt streets within the city limits. Okay, and you'll see those pictures there where you have a proper curb and gutter street, uh, brand new that's completely redone, uh, and then you have uh, asphalt on a ribbon paved street which is very common in older streets in, in Durham. Next slide, please. Once council orders the improvements to be made, the project is put into the city CIP process to compete for funding. That funding is needed for design, construction, right-of-way acquisitions as necessary, utility reconstruction and uh, re utility relocation and construction. We have 10 previously ordered petition projects of paving and utilities that are currently in the queue. Uh, the current street improvement contracts are ST271 and ST286, and they will deplete all of the allocated funds for current petition projects. Next slide, please. Uh, assessment rates are set by council. They are periodically adjusted based on the average cost of the most recent city contracts. Street improvement assessment rates historically set um, on actual cost of construction to recuperate a percentage of actual cost of construction. That rate adjustment was last made in 2006. Okay. Water and sewer main assessment rates historically set to recuperate 90% of actual construction cost. That last rate adjustment was made in 2010. The new assessment rates would be coming out once current contracts are completed and actual costs are calculated in uh, the remainder of those contracts should be finished in 2021 and 22. Uh, council has the authority to reject petitions if they so choose. Next slide, please. Uh, this is information on the current petitions, uh, Linden Terrace, which is a curb gutter and paving, and there are existing water and sewer laterals in this uh, project site, excuse me, 
uh, mains in the project site, and this will be the addition of water and sewer laterals. Uh, Ardmore Drive is a curb gutter paving water and sewer main project, and then water and sewer laterals as well. Uh, there was an initial petition to extend, issued in 1999, to extend the full length of Ardmore, but that was never returned as a sufficient petition. They couldn't get the required number of signatures. And then uh, sewer mains were extended in most of Ardmore Drive under two separate projects that were done under the Enab City's Enabling Act authority due to health hazards uh, because of the existing septic systems that were in that area. Uh, there are a couple of vacant properties that do not have access to city sewer, so they would be part of that extension of city mains for city sewer. Uh, originally, there was, or recently there was a project uh, that is just done part of Ardmore Drive, 950 feet, and that was recently done and ordered by council originally in 2008. Uh, the water main was installed in 2012 and 2013 as a result of previous petition improvements ordered by council, and there was a current petition for remaining portion of Ardmore was issued March of 2018. Uh, that did not return a sufficient number of signatures to move forward until June of this year in 2020. Next slide. Uh, there are two options for council on petitioning for improvements. You can order the construction of improvements with subsequent assessments based on current rates. Projects will then be submitted into the CIP for approval to fund. Option two is you may reject the petition and allow new petitions to be submitted with higher assessment rates in the future to recoup more of actual cost or implement a full cost recovery process. In order to do that, you would need to adopt an ordinance establishing either the increased assessment rates or the full cost recovery. Next slide, please. Uh, frequently asked uh, questions we get on the petition process, who can petition for and vote? Anyone can request a petition. However, only abutting property owners can sign the petition because they are the ones who will be assessed. City Council votes on whether or not to install an improvement in response to a valid petition being received. And the types of petitions uh, that are successful have two criteria must be signed by over 50% of the number of owners of properties abutting the improvements and the road frontage of those properties whose owners signed must equal over 50% of the area within the petition limits. For sidewalk improvements, this required, and this is sidewalk only improvements, the requirement is 70% for those criteria one and two. Uh, in the design and construction of new improvements, a lot of questions we get is who can be considered and who can be talked to. Residents, property owners, renters, and users of the infrastructure can express comments. Anyone can attend these meetings and anyone can send in comments as they are welcome. Community meeting is always held to give residents and owners an opportunity to review and comment on these preliminary designs prior to construction of the project to get community feedback. Next slide. Does council, members of council have any questions for me? Thank you, Mr. Joyner. I really appreciate it. Um, colleagues, uh, questions for Mr. Joyner? Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Joyner, for refreshing our memory, or for some of us, um, the first time we're hearing this info. Um, of course, I'm thinking about, you know, the round of water and sewer extensions that we had a couple years back where we ended up um, absorbing a much higher percentage of the cost than we had initially anticipated because of increases in, in costs over the several years that the petitions had sat and acted upon. Have we taken action to prevent that kind of situation from happening in the future? And if not, like, can we, and what kind of action would we need to take? So that action that would need to be taken would essentially be full cost recovery. And that action has not occurred yet. We are also looking to see what the final assessment rates would be and the cost of new construction. 
In the previous uh, water and sewer rates that you mentioned, one of the things that I would want to put out there is those projects occurred in the county and they were outside of the city limits. So we were actually fixing DOT roads on those particular items and DOT had installed new policies that had greatly increased the cost of those far beyond what was expected. So some of the things that occurred to really increase those costs a lot uh, would not be a consideration or, or an issue for these types of projects inside the city limits. And those DOT roads at that time, I would also like to mention were not really built to the most compliant DOT standards of today. Uh, and they were substantially aged. So the type of reconstruction that was needed on those improvements greatly exceeded what one would normally expect in this type of process. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful in allaying some of my anxiety. Um, do you, so as an alternative, I mean, I, I think the, the question of full cost recovery is, you know, that's like a policy decision that we have to consider and it would be helpful to know what other cities in the region do with regard to that question. And then the other thing I'm thinking is, could we, could our policy be X percent of full cost, but, but implemented at the time of actual construction so that we're, when we're computing the rates, when we're computing what people would be assessed, it's based on the cost that we expect to actually incur rather than the cost at the time, the cost that, is relevant at the time of the petition. Yes, we could do that. We could essentially uh, go back in and change the ordinance to look at full cost recovery at the time of impact. And that would also deal with the problem of timing. Um, just because council orders these improvements at the time, that doesn't actually create the need to go forth and, and do those. Uh, it has to compete with CIP funding under the council's directive and initiatives and priorities, of course. And so in some cases, as you'll see on these types of assessments, you'll see a great deal of time has passed between when the petition improvements were ordered and when they're actually being constructed. And that has to do a lot with competing priorities over time. And so going to full cost recovery would uh, greatly change that math and, and would allow the city to recoup those costs in their entirety as they're actually uh, made. Great, I think that sounds like what we should do. And thank you so much for all the information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one other issue that I wanna raise, I think about all the, you know, so you describe the way in which this competes with CIP, other CIP projects. And those other CIP projects all come to us through some sort of process that the city has, our city of staff has built a rational process that uses an equity model and an equity lens to try to figure out. So for example, the bike walks plan, uh, this looks at lots of different aspects of, uh, you know, it looks at uh, uh, racial equity. It looks at, uh, uh, distance to a school, it looks like, you know, it looks at safety. All these are considered in building a plan. And when these petitions come in, they come in outside of that plan. And yet they're competing for the exact same resources. And so the petition process has always given me concern um, as an equity issue. We, as you say, Mr. Joyner, we don't get it very often. Uh, and so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't impinge on us a lot. But when I think about a million dollars, um, which is essentially, I think 1.1, 1, 1 million, 1.1 1 .1 is this, the Ardmore uh, uh, project would be from city funds after we do the cost recovery out of the current formula. It troubles me. It troubles me as a policy matter, uh, not, not making any judgment about the people that, brought the petition to us. I get why they did it. Uh, but it's competing, for example, with, um, well, just to take the example that's coming to our inbox recently is uh, Junction Road. I mean, these are all, you know, I, I worry that when petitions come to us, they disrupt an equitable process. 
Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Mr. Joyner, about the competition and those resources? That is a very difficult thing to control because uh, it's driven by uh, request from residents as they get together and, and deal with their uh, micro community needs, I guess would be the best way to say it. Um, yeah, I think that's right. And I, th and I think that, you know, it's, it's a process that's driven by property owners. Uh, property owners, you know, aren't always the people that should be determining where we put our sidewalks, our curb and gutter and so forth. And we do such a good job with that systemically throughout the city that it gives me concern. You know, the, I, again, you know, I'm struck by, if it's full cost recovery, that's a different story. Then that, that's, that changes things a lot. So anyway, we've got to, we've got to do this at the uh, public hearing, but if there are any other questions or comments at this point, colleagues, council member Freeman. Thank you. I appreciate the mayor's uh, explanation because I, I hadn't thought about it in that vein of it. Um, acknowledging that uh, I, I actually served on the advisory board for the CIP and developing the race equity or the equity format to try and do the red, green, yellow, blue, you know, on which projects move forward and acknowledging that it does create the disruption, but it'd be the same disruption as doing participatory budgeting. And so I just want to make sure that we don't um, miss that um, and that those those projects are also being added in and that's coming from the community from a micro level and I don't want to discourage folks from being engaged in the process so yes those property owners may be um, not who you want to direct it but oftentimes I mean the people that live on those dirt roads are folks that have um, not always chosen to have a dirt road in front of their house and so just acknowledging that specifically for this paving situation, it might be a little different in acknowledging who the property owners are and how they move forward and pushing a petition forward. Uh, I just had a question specifically around, you know, this is assessing a fee essentially with the full cost recovery. Has there been in the instances where you've noticed um, a lien had to be put on a home or a property and folks have lost their property? Because that would be my um, one concern around full cost recovery. I would have to um, do some research on that with the finance department that controls uh, these items. We, we set up the accounts as a part of our, but we do not control the payments over the eight years that these uh, items are typically paid out over. And then I was also just wondering if, uh, if, if grant funding had ever been uh, researched around doing some type of uh, just acknowledging that the dirt roads are harder to uh, control the flow of water. And this stormwater and resiliency conversation, has there been any conversation with the uh, EDA on, or the, I'm sorry, Economic Development Associ uh, Administration around making sure that those funds are available uh, just so we're not pushing the cost to uh, residents in the community? Because what I, what I am mainly concerned about, and I'll just say this up front, is that it's not the property owner that will carry the burden. It's the renter in the home whose rent will go up because the order has been passed and they finally get the, the dirt road paid. Because uh, often those houses that are on those dirt roads are rental units. And it's, it's just, just making sure that we're not pushing folks out of their homes. But thank you. Thank you, council member. Mayor, uh, could I offer just one quick comment? I, I wanted absolutely. to acknowledge uh, I'm Bo Ferguson, Deputy City Manager and Mayor. Thank you for the, for a minute. I wanted to acknowledge the the council the questions you've raised, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Member Freeman. I, I think we anticipated that there may be a disconnect between the values and philosophy that originally undergirded the petition process and and where this council may be now. And uh, in part, we we wanted to put this presentation out there to call that question a bit. Um, this process has you know been legitimately started by residents of these two streets and needs to come forward uh, to the council. But I think we did want to call out uh, some of the priority setting questions that have been raised here. Uh, and hearing your comments today, I think help us to, to both you know, process, uh, to, to consider how this process works uh, and to potentially bring back uh, policy level discussion for the council so that you can provide us direction on how future 
changes might be uh, considered for the petition process. So I just wanted to acknowledge that we're sort of hearing these questions. We uh, wondered if these questions were out there and, and we're grateful for that feedback. Uh, in the meantime, you know, we'll continue to uh, be happy to answer questions about these two petitions as well. Uh, and uh, I'll confer with public works staff uh, after this about, uh, and uh, Madam Manager, uh, about the potential to come back to council uh, on sort of a policy level discussion about the petition process. Thank you, that's very useful. Let me ask about the timing a little bit then. So do you think we should have that policy process, policy discussion before we have this public hearing or at least concurrent with it? Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, Bob. As Mr. Joyner reported, uh, you know, uh, some of these petition processes have been under discussion for uh, for a while, and these communities really began this process. Some of them, while these petitions were filed in the last couple of years, the discussions predate those. For that reason, you know, the, I believe it's appropriate for council to consider these actions. Uh, again, you you have several options. You may you may order them. Uh, you may choose not to order them. You may, uh, in choosing not to order them, you may suggest to residents that they can that they could reapply under a full cost recovery model. Uh, but I think rather than delay that discussion, you know, you, you probably have the information you need to decide on these two That's items. Uh, and then I think going forward, you know, we could come back and uh, give council some options to rewrite the rules for future petition processes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and would be happy to facilitate that conversation. Thank you. And I think Councilmember Freelon had a question. Yeah, sorry. I thought I was muted. Uh, with no that worries. Um, yeah, well, um, uh, Mr. Ferguson, uh, Bo, um, hearing you kind of uh, reflect on just getting general feedback has compelled me to speak. Um, so Mayor Shul mentioned the Junction Road emails that we've been getting in. And, uh, you know, I'm also thinking about what Council Member Middleton uh, referenced earlier in regards to, you know, the squeaky wheel and, and the ways in which privilege plays a role in folks' ability to organize to get the things that they want out of council and uh, you know, there, there's a member of our community that just seems like it, just an individual out there with her phone documenting what is a dangerous situation on her road with, with no sidewalks. Um, I don't know to what extent they have the capacity to you know, organize the adjoining neighbors and to do the requisite uh, work to meet the standard for our current petition process. So I guess Bo, to your, uh, to your back to the drawing board conversation, I would offer uh, this example as a as a something to consider. And someone like this this person who's been reaching out, I can forge you the correspondence, and I've been in contact with Sean um, about that. Uh, but I yeah, I would want to consider from an equity perspective, but also hearing with. Um, Council Member Freeman was saying about uh, participatory budgeting and the ways in which we've created loopholes in other contexts. Um, I hear that as well and want to be consistent. Um, but I think this particular example uh, and the the uh, shortcomings of of creating such a high bar in, in the uh, process in the petition process might be something to can reconsider as we think about an equitable model moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to offer that and, and, and amplify what Mayor Shul kind of mentioned in passing, which is, you know, we've been getting emails about Junction Road. So I'll forward you those emails and would love for you to take that into consideration. Sure, thank you. And just as a, a point of information, Junction Road is a, a state a DOT road. Uh, it's not a city road. Uh, and I did receive a text from Public Works Director Marvin Williams that uh, he understands that uh, Sean Egan in transportation is uh, in receipt of that. I, I would also be uh, happy to review those emails and make sure we're responding appropriately. Cool. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member, and thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Those were very helpful comments. Um, and Mr. Joyner, thank you for being here. We always appreciate your presentations and um, 
seems like you often get the sticky wicket. Um, and uh, we're glad for, we, we just want to tell you how much we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Happy to serve. It, it, it could I got to find a way to use that sticky wicket. Got to find a way. <laughs> well, I don't think, colleagues, I'm not sure that any of you all were on the council uh, when we went through the uh, failed development phase after the recession, but uh, Mr. Joyner was running point on that, and we were and, and figuring out ways to get developers to come in and take over these failed developments and try to keep the city out of having to pick up a lot of expenses. And um, I know you don't miss that, Mr. Joyner. Yeah. It's good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, colleagues, I think we have completed our agenda, except for now we'll hear, uh, we'll, we have the closed session, but now, Madam Clerk, can we hear from you about the um, about the appointments? Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll have my assistant clerk, Laverne Brooks, report on the Affordable Housing Implementation Committee because you had a question on that. All right. Ms. Brooks, we're happy to have you with us <laughs> getting towards um, retirement. Yes, I'm still trying to believe it's that time. It came, came sort of quick in, a, in one way. I can't believe it's been 30 years. <laughs> I can't either. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council members. Um, I just wanted to share, you saw the note in about um, Ms. Vic Lewis. She is, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's currently serving on the Homeless uh, Service Advisory Committee as a um, uh, former homeless person. She's been on, she came on in 2018. So she'll come up on a year in um, June of next year. I'm sorry, on a three year term, she'll come up on her first term next year in June. Here's the, um, the reason why I put this note in because in council procedures, it says on number 13 that citizens must serve one full term before they are eligible to apply to any other board or committee and then it says, except in unusual circumstances. And the reason why I brought this to you is because um, we have three we have three seats for a uh, person who's uh, receiving assistance from Durham Housing Authority, and we haven't had any applicants. She's the only one that has put one in so far. And I talked to Ms. Vic Lewis, and I want y'all to know she is so um, so. Uh, ready and and just really wants to serve on this affordable housing, understanding that you know she it wasn't around when she got appointed to the committee she's on now, but uh, she is truly committed to wanting to serve. So that's why I bring it before you, because you do have that um, except in unusual circumstances. Um, Ms. Brooks, that was super helpful, um, and the comment that you made on the um, on the the written comment you made was as well. I think we've got a couple different issues. One is uh, she's our appointment to the HSAC. And I believe that she is now an officer of the HSAC. Um, and I know she's been very enthusiastic in that role. I think, let me suggest colleagues. So she is excellent. Uh, I, don't, I think a lot of you all know her. Uh, she would be a great member of the bond implementation of the housing, affordable housing implementation committee let me suggest that we have time between now and when we actually do the vote on Monday night, 10 days from now, uh, that uh, we have a discussion with her about which board she would prefer to serve on uh, because she would have to give up the other board. So um, does that suit you colleagues? If we wait on that decision until we hear from her? Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Sure. <laughs> Sure, Ms. Brooks Clark. has had a conversation with, um, with the applicant. Okay. And I think Ms. Brooks has information regarding this. Yes, Mayor. I was gonna. I didn't want to break it on you, but yes, she. Um, I talked with her, and she understands that she actually wants to resign from the uh, Homeless Services Committee to be on this committee. Okay. She well, that's that, very and that helpful. is her preference. Yes, that is definitely her preference. Okay. Well, then, if she's not appointed. If she's not appointed, she says she will continue to serve on the homeless, but she really wants to be on this on this committee. All right. Mm -hmm. So 
I think you all have heard what uh, Ms. Brooks has said that we, we are trying to fill these positions. We have had a couple of rounds of applications and we haven't had but one applicant yet for the three positions. We would have to violate, uh, violate's not the word, we would have to override our, uh, our policy uh, under this exceptional circumstances uh, provision because she hasn't served one term yet on the, the board that she's on now. Uh, so I guess I'll put that to you colleagues, given that Ms. Vick would like to serve on the uh, Housing Bond Implementation Committee do you want to override our policy uh, under this exceptional circumstances provision to allow her to do that? And I'm interested in any thoughts you may have. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm prepared to accept the uh, strong recommendation of the sitting mayor of our city as an exceptional circumstance. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I'm comfortable with appointing her to to the Affordable Housing Implementation Board. I do want to give some further consideration to the fact that we haven't had any folks from DHA apply to that board and that their voice is really important to the bond implementation because of how much is going to DHA. Um, we had hoped that we would be able to offer stipends this year for board service in light of the fact that, you know, a lot of folks who are um, who are lower income or people of color are not able to participate as um, at their at their own like right footing their own bill at their own cost for transportation childcare you know having to have dinner out all that stuff but we took it out of the budget because of COVID um, I think that if we were to have that if stipends were available it would be significantly easier to find folks from DHA who of course you know face a lot of barriers to service I don't know. I don't know what to do, but I just wanted, I, I wanted to highlight the fact that we really need folks at the table and that right now we don't have a system that is, that is letting us get them. Thank you, council member. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but let me go back to the question of Ms. Vick. Is, is everybody, can I see some thumbs? Um, I, I heard from council member Milton. I heard from mayor pro tem. Okay. Ms. Brooks, uh, could yes. you be in touch with Ms. Vick then and tell her that's our plan? I will do that. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and we look forward to your farewell party. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, and then Mayor Pro Tem raised an important issue about, uh, I think that maybe what would be good uh, is if you could talk to Anthony Scott about it a little bit. Um, and just as our, you know, liaison, if you could talk to him and get his thoughts and, uh, other, you know, maybe other members of his staff uh, who he wants to include, uh, I think that would be good. Yep. I'm happy to do that. Good first step. Thank you. Councilmember Caballero. On the note of stipends, and this opens up a whole other conversation, but I just want to say that depending on where, as we move through our fiscal year and depending where we, where we are, I would be, I know we had talked about it needs to be universal, but I think if helping folks who are DHA residents, like if we need to narrow the stipend idea because of budget constraints to the folks who really, really need it, um, I'm just wondering if that would be helpful. We know these are three DHA residents. We know what the average salary is there for folks who live there. I think it's very different. So if our budget would allow it, it wouldn't be that much money, especially in, in this case, to open up the possibility, make it easier for folks to apply. Thank you. That's something, you know, that's certainly within our purview. Okay, other comments? Mr. Mayor, we need to continue with the boards and committee. Yes, um, we do. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. All right, um, for number three, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, um, for the appointment, Daniel Clever has been um, nominated for reappointment for the Urban Trails and Greenway category. Number four, Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau Board of Directors DBA Discover Durham appointment. Council has accepted the nomination of Ron Hunter to re represent lodging and limited services. And that was a reappointment. And then to appoint Thomas Lube to represent lodging and full services. The Durham Planning Commission appointment, 
item number five, council has nominated Kimberly Cameron to fill the seat. And finally, for the item number six, Durham Workers' Rights Commission, um, there was a technical issue with, with um, computing the ballot. We have three votes for Bria Williams and two votes for Stephen Cornegy. And I didn't know how you wanted to pursue that. Uh, Diana, I didn't, I'm, this is uh, Council Member Freeman. I was unable to submit and I would have submitted for Bria Williams. Bria, okay, so that makes four. So you've nominated Bria Williams to the Workers Durham, Durham Workers' Rights Commission appointment. And that's Thank all. You. Thank you. That's everything, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. M um, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I'm sorry if this has already been responded to via email, but we didn't receive the attendance record for Mr. Clever from BPAC in the packet and was wondering if we could get that before the meeting just to confirm that he's been attending regularly. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. All right, colleagues, um, I'll now ask, uh, we'll, we'll settle the agenda and then we'll move into closed session. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council, I have for you uh, consent um, items 1 through 15 and GBA public hearings items 16 through 21. Thank you very much. You have heard the recommendation to settle the agenda by the manager. Uh, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Council Member Freelon, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, we please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. And Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion uh, carries and we've now settled the agenda. And you know what I say? Who's Tom Bonfield? That's what I want to know. Good job, Madam Manager. You're carrying the ball. We appreciate you. Thank you. You're awesome. You, we, we, you got through Phenomenal. it. Phenomenal. We, we just pretended like nothing was different. Okay. Uh, thank you. Colleagues, we now have a closed session. Um, it's 3.01, and I need to go get an apple and a drink of water, and I bet you do too. So uh, I'm going to, and, and we also, of course, need to have folks leave who aren't supposed to be in the session and lock the meeting and so forth. So I'm going to say that we'll reconvene in five minutes. We'll see you at 3.06, okay? Thanks, everybody. <laughs>